So I thought about doing that on purpose a little bit as we were talking about. Um, so uh, Eli and then Rory, can you guys introduce yourselves? Yeah, so I'm Eli Parenzovich. I'm a infectious physician and epidemiologist at the University of Iowa in Iowa City and uh, the ID uh, associate editor for JAMA Network Open. And I'm Roy Perlis. I'm a psychiatrist based at Mass General in Boston and another uh, JAMA associate, JAMA Network associate editor. Okay, great. Well, thanks for joining us. Uh, so this has been a really interesting time uh, you know, as, as somebody who uh, spends a lot of time on Twitter and does a lot of my academic work on uh, medical education and journals on Twitter, um, it's been really interesting seeing the, uh, you know, spread of information in this kind of time-sensitive uh, new era of the, of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and then I think the preprint servers like BioArchive and MedArchive, which have been gaining a lot of steam recently, have become pretty uh, relevant. Um, so, you know, it, it's kind of been really interesting seeing the balance between kind of faster, earlier information versus the lack of kind of quality checks from um, pre-publication peer review. Um, so, Roy, why don't you kick us off? Sure. So, I, uh, I I guess I can speak to this from a couple of different perspectives. One of them is I came to realize early on that things like MedArchive are like drinking from a fire hose. Uh, and so when you found a few people on Twitter who are authorities, it's incredibly helpful to follow them and sort of, you know, I, my, my general rule of thumb has been if someone I trust thinks that this is an important paper, it's probably an important paper. Um, but the flip side of that is I've also been, I guess, a, a user of MedArchive in the sense that I decided right at the beginning uh, when I was cooped up in this uh, lovely space in my attic and not able to go into my wet lab, that I was just going to sort of write and, and learn what I could about uh, COVID in my own health systems data and would try as an experiment putting manuscripts on MedArchive as soon as I was ready to submit them. And we can talk some more about that because my experience there has been uh, maybe a little less positive, a little bit more mixed in terms of what I think MedArchive and Twitter in combination are good for or, or not. Yeah. Eli, what's your experience been so far with the preprint servers? Yeah, so specific to COVID, it's um, it's been interesting because we've been kind of able to see things before they hit our desk uh, at JAMA Network Open. So we're getting hundreds of uh, infectious disease COVID-related uh, papers uh, every week, um, and uh, and so we're kind of. It, it's nice to be able to see them uh, at Med Archive. I sometimes have read them before they even have shown up on my desk, and then we've also used it a little bit, uh, Fred Rivar and Steve Finn and I, uh, to kind of reach out to several uh, authors of papers we we thought we'd like to publish, and we've been able to encourage submission. So it's been positive that way. Uh, you know, without Med Archive, it would just magically show up at your door or not show up at your door and so how do you how do you kind of process that and then related to that you know using twitter that's probably the filter uh through which i see things appear on med archive like you can't just i don't like do a search on med archive every day for covid i think well, <clears throat> it would be like uh, drinking from a, a fire hose so yeah using it as a filter certain high profile authors and scientists i follow kind of point us to those things on Twitter. So that's kind of how I've been using it. Well, and Eli, I've been curious because I think one of the one of the um, arguments for MedArchive is that uh, it's kind of like the um, uh, poster presentations of your used to be where you would get feedback on your study as it is in progress. Um, are you seeing when, patient, when papers come from um, MedArchive that they actually have feedback on them or is it just like most things, the, the vast majority of, uh, of things online don't have comments on them? Yeah, the, yeah, the things that um, we've seen directly come to the journal that I haven't seen specific comments or, or changes with them. They're almost like what was submitted to Med Archive. But, and maybe we'll get into this uh, later in the half hour, but um, I have seen papers appear on Med Archive that have been retracted almost immediately. Um, there is, and you know, maybe that's because Twitter amplifies it and all the scientists, you know, chime in. There's some pretty famous examples where ret retraction, um, there was one in particular out of New Delhi, where the where the authors um, try, uh, looked at the uh, spike protein and suggested it was similar to H HIV's GP120, mm. 
and you know, oh, it's suggesting, oh, maybe this is coming out of a lab or something like that. And that was retracted within a day or so on, um, uh, I think, BioArchive. So, um, you know, there are some advantages maybe for quick retraction <laughs> compared to some of the delays we see in regular publishing models. Right. Although the flip side is, uh, you know, it's really hard to ring the bell. Um, I'm going to caveat this with the, the same way I start a lot of my uh, my peer reviews when I review articles is that the a lot of my expressed opinions are going to over represent the negative sides. Uh, and my the totality of my views is a lot more mixed, I think. Uh, but, you know, you know, it's there's still, you know, I, there's a lot of stuff, especially as you get farther away from medical professionals on Twitter who are still talking about, uh, you know, did this come out of a lab? Um, and, you know, once stuff's out there, it's really hard to unring that bell. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Now, does Twitter, for any of you, would you say that Twitter has acts as a screen in terms of, I think you had mentioned, um, both of you actually mentioned that, you know, you use it to, to, to find things that have been posted to preprint servers by people that you trust. So is that sort of like a step in terms of being pre-screened in terms of the things that you kind of look at or think about? So, I, I mean, I think ironically, we've sort of reinvented journals or at least journal editors that way, where there are probably three to five folks who I follow. And if, you know, if they think something is important, I'm inclined to look at it. And I'd say at this point, so early on, the ratio of MedArchive to journal publication was probably a lot higher. Now, I'd say the majority of them are actually things that are published. Um, albeit in a pretty expedited way where you know there hasn't been all that much peer review because it's been turned around so quickly. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I kind of feel like I have sort of a new set of journals that I follow and each of them is curated by uh, a particular expert. And I think that's good and bad, right? I think that there's definitely something to be said for that. It's just that you're placing an awful lot of importance on a relatively small number of people. And I think as we've seen, uh, you may lose minority opinions or sort of less popular perspectives. Um, and when people do step up and kind of try to play the devil's advocate, it doesn't always go so well. Yeah, I mean, and I think this is this is an interesting conversation. And I, th I think this is part of where the, uh, the Twitter comparison or the Twitter parallels have really carried for me, um, is that... Uh, you know, I, I certainly use Twitter. One of the main ways I find papers to read is, is you know, people who I trust uh, sharing papers um, or just when, when I notice something's being shared multiple times, like, oh, this is getting some traction. It's probably something that is, is relevant to me if I'm seeing it multiple times. Um, but we've also, you know, the, the, the double edged sword of information getting out there quickly or being amplified quickly also means that bad information can be get out there quickly and be amplified quickly. Um, I think we've seen this. I don't want to highlight this uh, too much to pile on, but like the, the John Unitas paper out of Stanford, or excuse me, out of Santa Clara um, from Stanford's data that had, uh, you know, got a ton of criticism early on because it's carried in the lay press as this, this new study shows X, Y, Z on the epidemiology. Um, but there's, you know, were a lot of critiques about how unrepresented the data were. Uh, Carl Bergstrom did some calculations showing the lower bound of their, um, uh, of their, uh, their IFR, their infection fatality rate was, lower than the per capita New York death rate, um, which, you know, it, you know, s makes it totally implausible, basically, uh, to be polite about it. Um, you know, I just choose, you know, one of the, I think, most well-known and, and staunchest people in EBM uh, over the last many number of years. Um, we saw this in Twitter a number of years ago when um, uh, Paul Merrick, uh, who, you know, had, had done some real, you know, had been a researcher for a long time, got some really, uh, you know, a lot of his, uh, I think, initial uh, fame in the Twitter, med Twitter community was for debunking CVP using great analyses of data, and then came out for vitamin C and sepsis in the lay press based on like 43 patients in a case series. Um, I was really, uh, I don't know, reassured at the time at how much, uh, despite, uh, you know, his prominence and him being on MCRID and things like that, uh, still resulted in a lot of criticism, and it wasn't just on a pedestal. Um, but I think we're seeing that now, you know, and there's big names, you know, like Ben, ben Gold, yeah, excuse me, Ben Goldacre's new paper that came out on Met Archive, uh, showing I think it was uh, uh, British epidemiology on COVID. Seems really good, and he seems like somebody you know who's who's been you know scrupulous and in the press pretty well. But but who knows? You know, is the shoe going to drop at some point? Yeah, I mean, it's it's just like anything else, though. I mean, 
kind of back to your earlier point, maybe, maybe coming back to this, but, um, you know, once ideas get out there, it's hard to put the genie back in the bottle and maybe happens quickly. We think now in COVID and med archive and things like this, but, uh, and Twitter especially, but, you know, we can think back, what was it? 1998 to the Lancet paper on vaccines and autism. And that paper was out there for 12 years before it was tracted, and the genie will never be put back in the bottle. I, can't, I don't know how many people have been harmed by that misinformation. And so I don't think it's anything about the specific model, um, it actually. I think we have to be careful no matter what model we uh, choose to you know, get data from, med archive, traditional publishing. It's all part of a... Uh, kind of a multiple ways we can uh, kind of filter ourselves a uh, you know, massive amount of information. And I guess the real issue is not for all of us, but it's how the general public takes all this or <clears throat> non-researchers. And so how are they able to filter any of this information, you know, once it gets on their local news or elsewhere? They're not following the same people on Twitter that all of us are following. <laughs> right. Yeah, that... Um... Absolutely. I mean, I've kind of long said as a as an active member and hopefully self aware critic of Twitter, uh, um, but still proponent, is that all the downsides of using social media, all the downsides of, of preprints, uh, are things that traditional medicine has had all along. People have always done things because someone said said it at a conference. People have always done things because it's something my Mickey senior said once. Um, th th this is just on a different scale, and it's expanding what our peer network is. Um, I'm going to take this opportunity to, to, to uh, quote myself from my favorite line I've ever gotten to a paper. Uh, it's the online community is far from the first place, or far from the first to place its prominent members on pedestals. The outsized influence of medical opinion leaders can be traced back to Osler, if not Hippocrates. Um, you know, we've always been doing this. Uh, and at the same time, we also complain about the 17-year average knowledge translation gap, uh, which you know, especially right now, we're seeing how important it is to get information out there. Um, I'm, I'm curious uh, to both of you, I guess, Roy, you can take this first. Uh, is there a certain type of information you think is is better or more likely to be untrustworthy um, if it's coming out quickly right now during the pandemic? I mean, I think the the area that I worry the most about is is therapeutics because there's such an urgency and a, a almost I'd say desperation for something anything uh, that will be effective and you know the hydroxychloroquine example is a really good one about a, you know poor quality study not peer-reviewed gets out there and kind of spreads like wildfire um, you know I the, the flip side just to to um, try to be a little more balanced, you know, we started early on um, trying to look using electronic health records at candidate drugs for repurposing. And we're trying to thread the needle between um, not wanting to put things out there that, you know, could, could have a similar risk, right? So not wanting uh, to, um, not wanting people to embrace this information, but on the other hand, wanting to make sure that folk, that other people trying to do repurposing work could have access to it. And I think, you know, and it, it I, I could have put it up on my website or whatever, but instead put it up, put it up on that archive and sort of made sure that I at least mentioned it in my Twitter feed. So anyone else looking for lists of things to run against their list or, you know, contrast with their cellular model would have access to it. So I, I you know, I think that at, to, to your earlier point, the sausage making has always happened. What's different is that it's so transparent. And I think it's an advantage that anyone can be part of this conversation. Uh, but we do have to be mindful that anyone can be part of this conversation, right? Yeah. So people, I don't know, Eli, what's your, what's your take? Uh, I mean, I, I mean, even on the hydrochloroquine example, um, that so that was published in an actual journal, right? I mean, it ha happened to be uh, the editor whose paper it was kind of slipped it through, right, with maybe shoddy peer review, but that wasn't a, a med archive paper, um, and and so, but uh, but uh, on the flip side, though, um, there was pretty swift. Uh, debunking of it. And there have been now so many studies, observational trials that have 
kind of set the record straight, if you will, that like, like no one thinks it's the the answer right now. Um, and so I, I guess. But the um, problem, lots yeah. of, but, but the problem is none of us think that it's the answer, but yeah. lots of folks out in the, the rest of the world still think it's the answer. I think mm -hmm. that's, the I think it's becoming less every day. But yeah, yeah, yeah. But I mean, just I just the counter. I mean, everything's happening like lightning speed, both the rise and fall of, of every every treatment, even ones we think have a, a better chance, like remdesivir is getting kind of hammered based on every little, you know, uh, bit of uh, study that comes out. I mean, the New England Journal published the case series that uh, really had almost no information in it. Um, and that was clearly peer reviewed and high profile, you know. Um, and yet, um, you know, probably didn't offer much information uh, as far as treatment efficacy. Right. And that, I mean, I think there's, there's three related points here is one is that peer review, uh, has never been a guarantee of accuracy or validity, um, which, you know, it, it, it's peer review helps, but is by far not, not perfect. Uh, I think also we've seen, um, you know, there, there's kind of been the meme from the beginning where we're seeing how many, uh, meetings just needed to be emails, um, and now we're seeing how many processes we can really speed up when we really need to. Um, and I think, you know, seeing how quickly good trials have gotten through is in some journals, we're, we're seeing, uh, you know, we can ramp up speed and we don't need 17 years every time. Um, and we don't need 17 months to go through journal peer review. Um, the, I feel, I don't know, it's, it's also the... I feel like there's a couple of different types of things that are coming through. And, and I think, you know, even though the, the Santa Clara paper had a, had a number of issues and, and was probably misinterpreted um, in the lay press uh, in ways that, I don't know, the, the external validity may, you know, experts, experts can critique a lot. There, there's a lot of like epidemiologic uh, studies are probably more like, you know, more likely to be less problematic than therapeutic trials. I think we've all seen how much a, a clinical trial um, interpretation or conclusion changes during peer review, um, especially with, you know, multiple, uh, primary and secondary outcomes and things like that. Um, you know, how many conversations with a trial is the, is the conversation, uh, we, you know, are the authors going to be okay with us changing the, their positive statements to X, Y, and Z because we interpret it differently. Um, mm -hmm. I found it helpful with a lot of things. I think kind of some of the on the ground things, you know, in the, in the ED with, uh, you know, we watched uh, our concern about aerosol generating procedures, uh, high flow nasal cannula, non-invasive positive pressure ventilation, uh, just techniques for intubation, techniques for PPE, things that, you know, I'd say I put in the box of critical care that we're never going to study perfectly. Um, so being able to get kind of operational nuts and bolts mechanics from colleagues has been really helpful or seems to be really helpful. We might be all wrong about all of it. Yeah, so that to me kind of underscores the like the fundamental question I keep coming back to is um, is the fact that this is COVID nineteen does that does that make this whole process deserve extra scrutiny because people are so desperate for information um, on all you know you know general public but also on the clinical side as well um, and you know I think particularly early on in the pandemic, there was this thought that we really need to be open and transparent and date, you know, share our data in order to make um, sort of sound, you know, policy decisions or, or clinical decisions or whatnot. Um, so I, I feel like there is that tension and it's particularly unique right now, given the current situation. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, I don't know. So that's that's a somewhat sort of my personal thought. Um, but I guess the other part to that, and just kind of going back to this question about therapeutics, is and we were talking about this earlier. Um, there was a recent article in Nature, in um, in which they discussed that a couple of the preprint servers are now going to be um, sort of have enhanced procedures surrounding articles that deal with therapeutic strategies that are only computational based. Um, and and actually sending sort of saying rather than putting those on preprint servers, those should actually go through a formal peer review process. And I'm just wondering what people thought about that um, sort of philosophy or shift. <laughs> I mean, it makes me uncomfortable to be honest because it's it, it, it decreases rather than increases transparency. And so I think it's very well intended. Um, but I worry that, you know, it's easy to move from there to other kinds of papers, right? Like, you know, something that identifies a new, um, risk factor, 
well, that's, you know, are you going to scare people unnecessarily if you, if you put it on a preprint server? Um, something that looks at long-term sequelae, you know, there's a race now to understand the sort of sequelae of, of COVID infection. Um, I could see doing a lot of harm with a preprint that you know, sounds the alarm unnecessarily there. So I, I think, again, I think, I think it's well intended, but when you get to that point, you basically have reinvented journals only with less transparency in terms of peer review and editorial boards and so forth. So I don't know. I'm curious what others think. Yeah. I mean, I, I think even, you know, sharing anything, uh, no matter what you share and I'm blanking on the condition they're linking in in kids in new york and other cities now yeah um, Kawas kawasaki uh, is like yeah disease. kawasaki yeah thanks Seth. yeah so the you know I, you know i tweeted that uh yesterday or the day before based on uh you know uh governor cuomo's uh release the information something like 73 children have had kawasaki's and three have died potentially and they were you know covid positive and people were like you're scaring people you shouldn't share this information and i, I was just you know, sharing information. And so, you know, I, I guess, you know, what's the kind of cutoff and right, if, if that kind of creeps into these preprint servers, or if we, you know, if there's some sort of policing of scary information, um, you know, it's a, so, what do you do? Yeah. So one, right. one, one very encouraging trend was um, my kids were arguing the other day and uh, my son looked at my daughter after she asserted something and he said, and what's your source for that? <laughs> um, and, and I think there's something to that, right? It's when, right. when everything is out there in near real time, um, you know, people need to be good citizens in terms of what's the source and, you know, how, how much do you trust one versus another? But I'd much rather teach people to understand the source than keep things from being out there in the first place. Uh, yeah, I think that's there, there's a, there's an XKCD cartoon that's making the rounds right now uh, that addressed that perfectly. That uh, suggested that news uh, sources describe preprint servers as PDFs um, <laughs> because <laughs> you know it, it, it's the calling it a PDF means it's somebody who's savvy enough to format things into PDF. So you get a little bit of that. <laughs> Uh, professionalism, um, but it's just a PDF. Uh, and what does that mean? And I think, Roy, to your point, the, the way I think about, you know, adding some levels of pre-publication peer review to preprint servers is is like an unhappy valley of journals, is it's adding some of the protection of journals and some of the potential, uh, I think, uh, I don't know, uh, authority of journals without actually adding the protection of journals. Yeah. Um, and, and I feel like the, the third point I was, I was forgetting before when I was blanking was uh, the opportunity cost of trying to unring bells. You know, how many negative trials of hydroxychloroquine did people spend time working on that we probably wouldn't have done, but for all the attention um, that it got in the first place? Same exact thing about vaccines. Um, you know, we spent a huge amount of research time and effort refuting a terrible 12 patient case series from 1999. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, the, as, as again, uh, sorry, I'm just going to segue into my, my, the last story I wanted to tell, um, you know, about the, the you know, the Kawasaki reminds early on, there were some stories of like, uh, uh, patients who were sick from COVID, uh, intubated, did better, extubated, doing great. And then suddenly crumping. Um, and it sounded a lot like myocarditis and cardiogenic shock. Um, and, I remember thinking at the time, I was like, wow, this is really scary, but wait, am I just hearing the same two or three anecdotes that are getting amplified? Because it's just the kind of story that's scary enough, that has some face validity, that makes sense. It's myocarditis, which is something that scares us, but we don't deal with that much, but we know it and it's a real thing and it's not, you know, crazy aliens and tinfoil hats. Um, and and I'm curious, you know, it, it just seemed like the kind of thing is like a Twitter, a med Twitter anthropologist, uh, that it just seemed like exactly the type of legend that made a lot of sense. And we basically, like, now we kind of think there's probably some myocarditis, but we're not all terrified all the time that all our extubated patients are going to crump. And, and that's an area where I think something like MedArchive can be helpful because having, you know, here is the source of, of these cases, right? Here is the source of this data it at least becomes traceable. You know, there's a there's a document there, even if it's just a PDF that someone was savvy enough to to generate. There, I think something like MedArchive actually fills a gap. Right. Yeah, and I, 
And it raises awareness too. I mean, it, it, as soon as you say something like that, everyone's interest is, you know, peaked and they're look, they're going to look in their own data or say, oh, I've started to see this too. Or, you know, I've seen Kawasaki's or something like that. Maybe I need to, you know, look at this more carefully and it becomes, you know, something we detect. And it kind of goes back to this whole COVID thing started with kind of a, a, a almost a preprint type uh, situation with ProMed. Uh, you know, the, it was all just people posting it onto this infectious disease kind of epidemic listserv December 31st at where it went like close to midnight, right? I mean, and that kind of got out there and spread that we didn't have to wait for, uh, you know, peer reviewed publication to know we had this giant outbreak in China and, you know, and in Wuhan and how it was spreading. And so, I mean, these are smaller components of that, but getting the ideas out, like, and I think Roy's point is excellent from his son, what was your source? As long as we know, like, it's okay that we share that the governor says he's seeing 73, you know, cases in New York, as long as we know it's the governor and not, you know, a peer reviewed publication, but then we can start looking for it in our own data. Right. And I think, you know, you know, uh, trying to end on a positive note, uh, I think there, there are lessons we can learn from these things. Um, you know, if, if, uh, you know, perhaps the the future studies, you know, somebody who's doing a study on what happens to their intubated patients says, hey, maybe we should follow these patients out for another week before we report our data. Um, or I was actually kind of disappointed in some of the early peer reviewed studies on the clinical characteristics that just described how patients did because they didn't talk about GI symptoms. And that's what, you know, a quarter to a third of the patients we were seeing early on was also knowing that I was absolutely um, sorry, I'm getting a phone call. Uh, yeah, the, uh, you know, I was absolutely, uh, I don't know, biased because my first patient was predominantly GI symptoms. So I know that where my biases came from, and then I was looking at these studies going, ah, oh, they're not even asking about abdominal pain in these studies. Like, this is our lived experience. And, uh, you know, we, we certainly can learn, you know, there's a, there's a reason there's a hierarchy of studies and we don't do clinical trials or nothing. Yeah. All right, let's go around. Let's do some final thoughts and tie things up. Uh, Roy, you want to go first? Sure. So I still think it's an incredibly powerful combination to get to disseminate information quickly and get people to look at it who wouldn't ordinarily look at it. So I, I think on balance, it's a net positive. But I think for me, making sure people pay attention to sourcing uh, is probably the most critical take home. You know, Med Archive is serves a different purpose than uh, than journals. And if anything, uh, Med Archive shows us why peer review is so valuable, frankly. Yeah, Eli? yeah and, I, and I agree, but I, I was just thinking, we thought about the counterfactual. Uh, what would it be like if we didn't have Med Archive right now? I mean, I think we'd be in a far worse situation. Um, I've learned a ton from them, uh, you know, papers submitted there and had to unlearn a few things too, right? We, uh, that we saw there. Uh, but I think it's been a, a net benefit. And, you know, even on the flip side, and I've kind of hinted at this, there's something called retraction watch. I mean, there's thousands of papers. I don't know what the exact number on Ivan Aransky's uh, retraction watch, but even peer review isn't perfect. And so science is messy and this is all part of it, but I'm really glad we have Med Archive um, and Twitter and journals that are rapidly peer reviewing, if you can find reviewers. Um, uh, you know, review papers if we send them to you, by the way, or, or suggest reviewers. Anyway, that's my last point is it's impossible we, to find reviewers these days. But, but, uh, yeah, but actually, we should understand that. Eli, that's a critical point, because I think as urgent as this information is, peer review has slowed to a crawl because so many reviewers are saying no. So as a public service announcement, you should you should say that a second time. Okay, please say yes or suggest colleagues who will review, especially if they're infectious disease types. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm going to add my very, very brief two cents to follow up on that is uh, I think overall, uh, you know, you're totally right. Getting information out quickly has been helpful. I think to me, one of the biggest benefits of Twitter is the second order. Uh, I get other smart people like you guys who critique papers when I see the papers. So uh, I think having the expertise of interpreting studies on Twitter um, from others is really, really helpful. Um, and Angel, you get the final word. I was just going to say you have to take the good with the bad with everything. And I think all of us, you know, just need to be try to be responsible science communicators. Um, that's kind of the best I think that we can do that I try to do at least. 
Great. Well, thank you all so much uh, for joining us. This has really been a lot of fun for me because I'm a big nerd. Uh, for more science communication, join Angel and me tomorrow. We're actually going to be talking about one of the Wuhan epidemiology papers that's uh, in Gemini Network Open uh, tomorrow, Tuesday, uh, May 12th at 3 p.m. Central Time, our uh, normal JNO, which is still going to happen tomorrow. Follow us on all your social media channels. Uh, get all the papers at GemmaNetworkOpen.com, where everything's free and open access and new papers every day at 10 a.m. Roy, Eli, Angel, thanks so much. Thank you both.